BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 103, Obamacare, Part 1. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging, covering treatment and solutions that include bioidentical hormone pellet therapy, safe and affordable skin rejuvenation, and spa quality botanical skin care. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional so counselor. I am a provider, and you are a provider of medical services. They've dumbed down the word doctors and, yeah. and, and counselors. They've now made us providers, so we're all the same. Well, except <laughs> that provider is appropriate when we follow what your advice to me constantly is, and that is follow the money. Well, when you're trying to figure something out in healthcare nowadays, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how you figure it out. You follow the money. You have to figure out who's paying. That determines the how much care you're going to get and how much access. And who's going to provide it? Who's going to provide it? All of mm -hmm. those things determine your health. So, in general, in the healthcare system in the U.S., if you want to know how much room or how much say you're going to have in your own healthcare, mm -hmm. you have to look at who's paying for that because you may have the answer to your healthcare needs and they won't pay for it. It won't be a service they pay for, or it won't be, there won't be doctors available, or the wait will be six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's access. And, and what the doctor gets paid determines, basically, what services are going to be rendered. Because if, if you pay him or her under what their overhead is, uh -huh. they're not going to offer that service anymore. They can't. They can't stay in business. Right. So, the medical system as a system is so complex. I mean, there, there are is. multiple entities. You, you go, uh, you have the option of talking about the medical system from the standpoint of being a physician. Right. From the standpoint of looking at a hospital, a mm -hmm. public health clinic, uh, a place like Planned Parenthood, mm -hmm. uh, a pharmacy, mm -hmm. a compound pharmacy or, or a uh, compounding pharmacy like like the one in Colorado that's mm -hmm. in so much trouble. Nope, they're not in Colorado. They're, they're not in Massachusetts. Colorado. They're in Massachusetts. Thank you. For the, that. One in Col the one the in one Colorado, Colorado is okay. awesome. The one in <laughs> and Massachusetts. And Minnesota and, and and Wisconsin. I mean, that's the only compounding pharmacy out of thousands of them that's right. in trouble. Right, but so, they are part of that global entity that we call the medical system. Yeah, and, and then you also talk about hospice centers and uh, home health care. Re retirement homes, home health care. It's such a huge octopus. And, mm -hmm. and so when people say, oh, well, the medical system, when politicians say, oh, the medical system, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, insurance, uh, self how does, how does an or ordinary no person figure out how to make good medical decisions? How do you get good medical information? You know, when, when you look it's at, tough. okay, what am I, I'm 65 years old. I have gotten this year, pr prior to my birthday in September, I bet I got a thousand pieces of mail that cost money to send and package Tons, and mail and print it's and design it's a big and business. to sell me a product that is best I can understand the parameters of are limited by federal law mm -hmm. and who can provide them are limited by federal law. But all of these providers are calling me, uh, phone calls. That's somebody for Medicare on the other. is what he's talking about for, for just Medicare next year. Yeah, and and so. But that's not just Medicare. That's not the government. That's another layer of control of the Medicare dollar, because the med there's a there's a certain amount of money that is set aside for Medicare by the government. Right. Okay, and then they've allowed HMOs and PPOs or insurance companies to then parcel out care. It does two things. It keeps you separated from the Medicaid system or the Medicare system right. by putting an insurance company in between so that you can't really blame the government. You can blame the insurance company, but it also kind of like when somebody sells your car, your car loan, right. then you can't go back to the dealer right. and, and say, hey, you sold me a bum car. Yeah. You know, so they put a level of cushion in here so that the government's not really responsible. So they have the insurance companies administer it, but they administer means bill. That's what it should mean. What it really means is it bills, it limits your care more than Medicare. It tells you it has to be making money because it's paid what Medicare would normally pay on your behalf. 
then this other layer then is paid and they make a profit by limiting what you can get for your health care. Okay. They limit your care. So, so their goal in life is to maximize their income or their retention so, of money and the that's only way assigned they, to them. And they're paid amount per person. Right. In their plan. So, so, so that's called capitation. Right. And, and that's and the motivation is buy the insurer, save money. Mm -hmm. That means don't give care. If you think about it, or give the, the least cheapest e thing expensive in, care. In if you look at what's wrong with the government <laughs> Take two aspirins and call me in the morning, that's a hundred dollars. <laughs> that's I wish. Yeah. But that's not how it works. <laughs> I mean that what hap has happened now and what will happen if we go to Obamacare is that Medicare will be getting a certain amount of money, the rest of healthcare will get the rest of the money, and then they'll say, how many people are we insuring? They'll divide it by the person and they'll say, how much care can we render? And then they'll start limiting what you get, okay? Mm -hmm. So if the government's gonna do this, they're gonna add other le levels mm -hmm of government in between to administer all this. So they're taking more money out of the system instead of going from Medicare to your doctor. It's going from Medicare to, to different levels of administration because you know there's no government without tons of layers of administration. Then that dollar's been decreased to 75 cents on the dollar. Then that goes to an HMO to then distribute it or an insurance company. Mm -hmm. they, they then limit everything. As the money gets smaller, your, your choices get smaller. Right. So they'll say, oh, you don't need a mammogram every year right. after 40, every which three you years. do. Yeah. You need a mammogram because it takes 7 to 11 years for a breast cancer to grow, and you don't know what year it's going to show up. Mm -hmm. So after 40, you need one every year. But... Then the government develops panels like the task force mm -hmm. on um, on medical care, and mm -hmm. they tell the the population, "You don't need this. You really don't need that. Your doctor's just being doing defensive medicine. Well, it's know, not we, true. We you need a mammogram that. every year." We looked into that, and the task force recommendation that was in the news just this week about that. They said you don't need estrogen. You don't need hormone replacement. Right after all these other studies came out and said you do need it and you need it for a long time. So so the task force is a group of 16 volunteers and you, you have to volunteer but somebody else has to nominate you as a volunteer. And you have to have somebody backing you like a private doctor couldn't do this because mm -hmm. there's they have to sit in a room talking about health care where the private doctor has to earn a living. So it well, has to be somebody who has an income paid in a different way. Yeah, so their income is paid in a different way and they volunteer to be on this task force and the objective that's defined for them is they're supposed to survey the research that everybody is doing and collate, uh, assimilate, collate, and disseminate the best practices data or Well, that's thoughts. what they... That's what they're supposed to do. That's what they say they do. Yeah. But in reality, all public health, public health will be running our, running Obamacare, okay? So all public health says is, here's the amount of money you have, divide it up by the number of people, figure out how you can limit care. It's just like insurance companies. We're going to limit your care, but we're going to tell the, the population, we're going to tell all those people out there that we're taking care of that you don't need these things. That, and you don't know. I mean, your doctor does. So instead you don't of know. saying we can't afford them, oh, you yeah, say, they you, say don't you don't need, need them. Them. Or it's dangerous. Right. They can scare you and... and and say, oh, that's well, dangerous, or, or and then you they, don't They get could them. say, you know, we really do think that every woman in America needs a mammogram after 40 every year mm -hmm. of her life, but we only have this much money, so what services then are we not prepared to offer? Right. Measles shots to babies? Uh, I know, I mean, I mean... Because, again, if you have a pool of dollars, you have to spread it across 350 million people in the, in the country mm -hmm. to provide the best average range of services. That's right. And people and, that fall well, off either end of the average. average. It's not average. It's not average. It's the okay. low, when you say standard of care. Yeah. Standard of care is a legal term. It means the lowest level of care that you can give without violate, without um, performing malpractice. So okay. standard of care is not, oh, it's up here. Standard of care is the lowest level of care you can have right. to actually not be in trouble legally. 
Okay. So when they say this is standard of care, they're going, oh, this is the minimum of what you should get. Yeah, what I learned about that is that in order not to be deemed negligent and therefore respons the responsible mm -hmm. party, is I had to provide services, uh, say somebody that was suicidally depressed, mm -hmm. uh, if they kill themselves. Mm -hmm. And then somebody wants to come back to me as a therapist mm -hmm. and say, did you do what you should have done? Did you do what is standard for people treating this illness? Mm -hmm. uh, they talk about what's the standard of care mm -hmm. in your community provided by people with your credential. Right. So, but that's the lowest level of care that you can provide. Yes. So everybody thinks standard of care means, whoo, it's way up here. Mm -hmm. It's the minimum. It just means, did you screw up? What's, right. what's the screw up level? Yeah, what's the screw up level? And so, so when we have the, first of all, the task force is made up of PhDs mm. and everybody's in public health. None of these people are spending their day taking care of patients. None of these people are. They're all college professors. They're college or professors. Or deans of they're colleges. teaching or they're doing research. But you have to really, okay, here's the really bottom line <laughs> medical care is between you and your doctor. It yeah. should not be deemed by a government, by an insurance company. It should be your decision with your doctor with the best medical information that you can possibly have for you. It's an individual doctor-patient relationship. We've developed all this junk on top of that that no one gets really good care anymore. They've tried to limit, and they make doctors the bad guy. What they, they limit what they pay doctors so they go out of business or they stop taking insurance like I did. They, they, or they don't okay. take Medicare, they don't take Medicaid, they stop taking all of these services, so you can't get in to see a doctor who takes those. Okay, okay. So, I'm not arguing that point no, with I you. No, I know you're not, because you, you can't win what that I, one. What, <laughs> you're what a provider, What I'm reacting too. to is they. Who in the hell are they? Because I don't understand when you talk about the octopus of the medical system, who all the they's are. Okay, the are. they's are the people that pay. And, and that the would be? The people that pay, which is the government, the okay. state, which works with the state government, federal the government. Federal government, state government. And then hospitals, because they're trying to, they have so many no pays, mm -hmm. they're trying to get the most out of what they do. They're also paid on a capitation, like if you have a surgery, uh -huh. they're paid so much per surgery. They're not paid by what you get so, during so that, is that surgery. So that why you get a bill from the surgeon, you get a bill from the anesthesiologist, you get a bill from the surgeon's practice, and you get a bill from the hospital. Right, but surgery. that's because you, now that's, that's different. When you're in the hospital for the surgical room, the surgical staff, the surgery, the actual supplies and everything, mm -hmm. instead of charging you for the supplies, for the actual hospital stay, and it doesn't matter how many days you stay in, right. they get the same amount of money. It used to be, if you were really sick and you stayed in 10 days, right. then they got paid more. So. The insurance companies have decided if we flat give rate. them a flat rate, they'll get people out of the hospital. So they, and have, they, did. they actually have computers that calculate all this stuff, yeah. that track all the different costs and say, you know, for a broken leg, you ought to get two and a half days in the hospital. Right. That's what they pay, two and a half right. days. Right, and two and a half days is not optimal. Two and a half days is the minimum. So, so you go in for your broken and leg, and if the doctor thinks you need to stay longer, then he's got to find something else wrong with you to run some tests for. Yes or no. I mean... I don't send people, I never sent people out. Yeah. I, it was the hospital's problem, but then the hospital should actually, they have to eat the cost. Right. That's a problem. And the way they eat the cost is a Band-Aid becomes $15. No, they don't do that anymore. They don't get paid by that. They get paid by a hospital so day. So how do they eat the cost? <laughs> volume, volume, volume. Okay. And they used to send me letters saying, Oh, your patient stayed in three days instead of two and a half days. Next time you should get your patient out in two <laughs> and a half days. We're watching you. And then they're, they're trying to shame me into sending a sick person home. That doesn't work for me, and it shouldn't work for your doctor. Well, but not only shame you. I mean, it, that's They a, should just pay for what they get. They should. It's their fault they took capitation. Hmm. I mean, it's the hospital's fault. Okay, so capitation. Capitation is when you sign a contract with a, a providing agency or company that says, say I, I sign a contract with uh, Xerox, that in the St. Louis area I will provide mental health services to Xerox employees. I sign a contract that's a capitated contract. They say in the St. Louis area we have th 5,000 employees. We'll give you $20,000 a year, every year, uh, and that's all we'll give you. 
and to you take provide care of you a provide the mental health patients. services for our fi any of our 5,000 people that need them. Now we've done all the math and we've tracked all the data, and we think that on average you're only going to see 200 people a year. So that's a good deal for you. You'll make more than your normal fee, but you sign the contract. And if they have a crisis in Xerox, and instead of 200 mentally suffering people, uh, people emotionally distraught mm -hmm. people, you got 5,000, you still have to see them for the $20,000. But it's bad on the patient's part because you can't see 5,000. So well, you're no. going gonna to make them wait for months and months yeah, and months Yeah, you wake a waiting list. And, and then, but, but I'm, it's like dollar cost averaging. I'm not getting the amount per hour that I figure my budget and my costs on. I'm getting a, a flat rate divided Asian. over fewer or more patients. They used to do that with family practice, and mm -hmm. I still think in some, of the in some parts of the country they do, where they said, okay, there's this many people, you're going to take care of this many, we're going to pay you this per head, and you're right. responsible for them. Well, that sounded good mm -hmm. until they, we figured out how much that meant, and it was like five cents on the dollar, and you're really losing money, so then the doctor has to eat that kind of cost. I'll, I'll tell you tell you what's happened over the last 30 years. Yeah. Since That's... I started practice in 1981, when I did a hysterectomy, which takes four years of schooling and intense work during your, the surgery, and it takes... And it's potentially life-threatening. I mean, you have a woman's no, life in your hands. It's high, it's high it... risk. So they, I used to get paid, and this sounds like a lot, in the 80s, mm -hmm. $3,600 for the pre-op care, which is the office visits before. The surgery itself, the rounds in the hospital, the um, so whatever the, that took, it was whatever that, much that for took. The, yeah, no matter how many days. Right. Then, I, it also paid that paid for the six weeks afterwards and anything that happened during that six weeks, and then at the end of the six weeks plus the preoperative care, I would get paid the thirty six hundred dollars. So if anybody knows anything about finance, that's the cost of money. You're not paid until it's over. Okay. Then, then you would get paid pretty much right away. So $3,600, okay, for, for a complicated hysterectomy. Right. So nowadays, the insurance companies, there's no negotiating in case you think that we call the insurance company and go, that's not enough. They say take it or leave it. You take all their patients or you take none, so they, there's no negotiating with doctors. It's against right. the law. You can't join with other doctors to negotiate. So we are, we're not on the same... Uh, playing field. We're, it's in, unequal with the insurance companies. They have lots of people doing this. So what I get paid, or I did get paid, was $600. $600 wow. for pre-op care, the surgery itself, the rounds in the hospital, post-op care. That didn't pay three of my employees just to cover pre-certifying. So where did the $3,000 go? It, it went to the insurance company. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Follow the money. And that, so that's why when you're looking at something and you look at your EOB and it says that your doctor charged $1,500, I want you to remember that he went to school for like eight years mm -hmm. or more mm -hmm. to do that. So no income and went to school and may have paid money to go to school. Like medical school is now $250,000. And, so and, but an not only that, he also has other costs. His office costs, his staff, well, his liability yeah. insurance. But but. People think, well, oh my God, you know, two thousand dollars is a lot to do yeah. sinuses. Oh, well, they that think doctor, that's free money. For you, got two thousand dollars today just by stopping by between golf rounds. But that's baloney. Doctors <laughs> usually don't play golf anymore. It's lawyers who play golf. I know that firsthand. So in general, <laughs> it's cheap shot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in general, what it is is you're not paying. You're not just paying, you know, somebody to be your surgeon. Mm -hmm. You're paying their malpractice, you're paying their overhead, you're paying their education. Right. You're paying, and you're, you should be paying their time. Mm -hmm. So what it's come down to is insurance companies pay less than it costs the doctor to do the procedure, and what you'll see is nobody will be doing hysterectomies. Mm -hmm. Because why should I go to the operating room to do a hysterectomy if I'm going to lose money? Okay, so. So that's, that's how it's, ra it's rationed. And, and, the and system when, when, now doesn't work, and the system, the rest of the system, doesn't work either. So what happens then is this this huge, complicated mess that's very hard to find a place to stand to look around and say, how do I make sense out of this? Mm -hmm. Some doctors are trying to develop what are called boutique practices, mm -hmm. where they go back in time, where they they contract with a set 
patient population that they interview and select and mm -hmm. interviews and selects them. And they set up a system outside of this other system so that they can provide the kind of care that they went to medical school to learn right. to provide. Uh, it's catching on, but it's catching on for those doctors that are willing to do it and, mm -hmm. and even make house calls. Yeah. Uh, but for those people that have the resources to pay for it. Right. I mean, that's, it's a matter, you know, that, that's the I mean, issue. Again, it's where's the money well, and how do you afford it? But many of these things, the, doc, the patient can then take the bills, not the, in a boutique, pra boutique practice, you pay like $1,500 a year to be in them. Mm -hmm. That's and As that's, the patient. And that's you, per A membership patient. fee. Yeah. Per patient, and that's not what I do. I don't right. do that. I have a different kind of uh, system. But they, you pay a certain amount of money, then you can take the bills for whatever you receive, and then send them into your insurance and get back yeah. what they'll pay. But, but because it's this boutique practice, they aren't going to file insurance. They're not going to spend the twenty cents on the dollar that it takes mm -hmm. to have a billing. Uh, group of people and a billing office. Yeah. So you save money there, no billing, but you have to then send in, in your EOB or your uh, HICFA forms, which are those little red right. forms right. to your insurance company. And then you have to wait for payment instead of the doctor waiting for payment. Right. So the doctor is trying to get themselves and their practice out of the insurance loop. Right. Because it, it keeps them from spending time with their patients. The other thing that you get is they limit the number of patients they have in a practice. Mm -hmm. So usually each each doctor takes only 500 patients or 700 patients. Right. So that means you can always have a lot of time with the doctor. Mm -hmm. And you can always go in and be seen within a certain amount of time that they have in your contract. So if, if you're the patient, that is excellent care because there's nobody else determining what your care is but you and the doctor. So, so I guess what's important here is to say there are alternatives out there but it's a minefield and you have to get information and you have to do research and you have to try to make good medical decisions and the system itself is not designed to make that clear to you not designed to facilitate your choice it's designed making. to make it confusing so that you don't like have it to is think designed. it through and gain and, the system and so we're going to continue this conversation in an additional podcast and one of the things we're going to talk about in the next podcast is how the interplay between the doctor, the hospital, the insurance company, the pharmacy, uh, all works in terms of the bills that come to your house that you're supposed to pay and the medical care that you can receive. And you take your little insurance card and you go to a doctor's office or the hospital or the pharmacy and you hand it to them and they say, oh, I, my son is on some controlled medicine for ADHD. And we went to get it filled at the, the drugstore the other day because we were going out of town and it was, they said, you've maxed out your lifetime benefit <laughs> at the drugstore. That's what they said. So we can't pay for this medicine anymore. Normally when we get it, it's a $30 copay. Oh, that's a new one. I said, well, how much would it cost me to just get it? Because I'm going out of town. $300. A month? Yeah, that's what it would pay. Okay, so what do I do? Well, go call your insurance company and negotiate with them. So I go home. I call the insurance company. I call the number on the card. And they said, well, that's not the place you're supposed to call for that. I know. that. Let me give you another number. And so they gave me another number. I called and go through the automated phone checklist system for a half hour wait, finally get somebody. And they're like, no, you were told the wrong thing at the pharmacy. There's no lifetime cap on this medicine. What you ran up against is because it's a controlled substance, it can only be dispensed every 24 days. And so it's 23 days since you got your last batch. Now that's so the you government. have to wait until tomorrow. <laughs> and tomorrow, if you go back, they'll pay for it. Now, so I'm, they told you the wrong thing. You wasted your time. And I'm just and a hopeless the hopeless consumer medication. who's sitting there saying, i got a kid that needs this medicine. My doctor says he needs this medicine. I can't get it. The fact that that's $300 is ridiculous because it costs well, about two cents to make. I understand that. I, I agree with that. I'm enraged about that. How do I make good decisions? So then I go back the next day, and they're prepared to pay for it. And the drugstore says, well, we don't have it. When, when we get it. Well, we don't know. It's a controlled substance. Oh the FDA, you know, authorizes the release of a certain amount of it. It gets distributed. Uh, That's where you go to go, another Go pharmacy. to another pharmacy. <laughs> okay. Can you call one and say, no, we're not allowed to discuss that over the phone. You have to go to the pharmacy. So I drove to That's three baloney. That's different... That's a lie. You need a different pharmacy. They can talk about it. They just didn't want to. I'm just telling you the way it happened to I know, the consumer. It's horrible. So as the consumer, you get enraged, you get upset, you get frustrated, and 
I think the technical term is screwed. Uh, why are you trying to pursue good medical decision making and, and good health care? And I have insurance and cash. So what yeah, about the poor just, person that I doesn't? Don't, I don't, I mean, it's... Can you feel the temperature in the room rising? The system's broken, and but Obamacare is going to make it worse. I don't know that, we need some problem solvers in government. I'm not sure that we have them. We just have, you know, shift the blame people. But honestly... Sorry, did you say shift the blame? Shift. Okay, I'm shift. just trying to hear you correctly. Yes. So All we right. need some problem solvers. And this is, isn't a problem that I can solve. I can tell you what's wrong with it, and I can tell you how I would solve it. But well, and I, how you do solve it for the I medicine do. that you do. Yeah. But we're, we're going to take a break now and calm our blood pressures down and reset and reframe. <laughs> and hopefully you can come back for our next podcast, uh, and we'll continue this conversation. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. Follow Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Brett Newcomb can be found at brettnewcomb.com.